Hi everyone, and welcome to the third episode in our Acorn BBC Micro series. If you remember, in the last episode, we did a full refurbishment of the machine and got her back to nearly factory new. There's a link on the screen if you want to refresh your memory before watching this episode. Back with us? Good, because today we're going to do something that really showcases how amazing these machines are, considering four decades have passed since their release. You'll remember that one of the most incredible things about these machines is the sheer number of ports and expansion capabilities that they carry. We touched last time on the number of unpopulated sockets on the mainboard and the ashtray expansion socket which could be used for plug-in ROM cartridges, much like a games console. There are also sideways or sidewise, I prefer sideways, ROM sockets available on the Beeb, which you can populate with ROMs and have programs available from boot without the need to load anything in from disc or cassette. Populating these requires opening the machine and removing or at least moving the keyboard to gain access to the slots, so it's not something you want to do on a regular basis and you typically load these up with the most useful or commonly used ROMs, such as language packs, word processors or assemblers etc. There are also only three of the five slots available as standard in a typical Beeb, with the other two being populated by the OS ROM and basic ROM. Very clever people, back in the day, designed and released sideways expanders, which were big clunky chunks of PCBs that allow you to put up to 16 physical ROM chips in your lovely Beeb, along with memory expansions etc. These are expensive and hard to find these days, so we need to find a solution for that. And then we have to think about media. Currently I don't have a compatible tape unit cable or disk drive, only this SPI solution which allows me to load off an SD card, which is good but is there something better? So today we're going to be doing a number of things. Firstly we'll be installing this 1770 disk filing system to give our Beeb the ability to read and write to disks. Next we'll add this GoTek floppy drive to give us a more flexible media solution. And we'll add this awesome 128k sideways RAM expander which allows us to slide up to 16 ROMs into virtual battery back ROM slots and gives us the ability to slide ROMs in and out of that bank of 16 as we see fit and without opening the case. And this will give us the ability to have on hand, on our GoTek drive, hundreds of ROMs for the BBC and we can choose 16 of those at any one time to be instantly available as soon as we power up. Happy days! We'll keep the SPI solution as well but now we'll have the option to either use the physical ROM supplied with it or instead use an MMFS ROM that we can slide into a sideways ROM slot when we want to use it. There is one other solution I want to add to this before the machine is moved to my desk to become my daily driver for writing these episodes and Chucky Egg of course and that's this awesome Raspberry Pi coprocessor. But that's a big topic for another video. Right, let's crack on. I've already removed the screws holding the unit together, so it's straight off with the top of the case. Dismantling the machine is covered fully in the previous episode, so I've skipped it here to allow us to get to the core bits quicker. I've also removed the nuts and bolts holding the keyboard in place, so we can just lift that out of the way. Doing so reveals the ROM sockets we mentioned earlier, and it's probably worth taking a little time to understand how these ROM sockets are ordered, how the OS decides what to do with them, and how we need to rearrange them to accommodate the modifications we're about to do. There are five ROM sockets running east to west across the board, and you'll typically find the westernmost slot contains the kernel ROM, or the base OS of the machine. Next to that, you'll probably find your basic ROM, the default language of the BBC, in our case followed by three empty slots. We need to add the disk filing system ROM here, but beforehand we need to move the basic ROM as the sideways expansion board aligns to need that socket. If you're doing this, please be careful when pulling chips and try not to throw them all over the place like I do. Spoiler alert in case you're worried, the chip's fine and good job too because we do need it and we'll place it back in the next slot along. Making sure the notch in the chip is at the same end as the notch in the socket and making sure all the legs are lined up correctly, a gentle push and the chip is secured in its new home. Next we have to cut link S9 on the board which enables the NMI line to the CPU which is necessary for disk functions to work. IC79 and 80 
are populated with these HD 7438P chips, which are TTL NAND gates, again required for disk operation. If when fitting chips you're finding that the legs are slightly too wide to fit in the socket, lay the chip sideways on a flat surface and gently bend the legs in very slightly on either side and try again. There's one more chip to put in for the DFS upgrade, but before we do that, it's time for the really fiddly bits. There are two ICs where we have to put in link pins to effectively bypass the chip. It takes a bit of time to line up, but then it's just a simple push fit. And believe it or not, that was the easier of the two. I'm thinking the next time calls for some long nose pliers. And now it's time to fit the actual DFS ROM package. The overhanging VLSI chip should sit to the west and overhang IC99, which hopefully at some point in the future will carry the speech processor. Firm but steady pressure and being careful that all the pins are lined up first, this package should just drop in. Finally, we need to install the actual disk filing system and we can't place it here because that's where the sideways ROM board will connect. We've already moved our basic ROM to here, so instead we'll have to place our DFS in this slot instead. I can tell you now that we'll be revisiting the location of that basic ROM shortly as a later discovery caused me to relocate it, but for now we'll pretend that everything's okay and carry on unknowingly. What we'll discover is that the sideways RAM board has options to either totally ignore the onboard ROM slots or to leave the kernel and two others active. We'll go over it in more detail later on and correct our little mistake then. So to recap, we've installed the DFS ROM and the ADFS package and we've popped in our fiddly link pins. We'll just pop in this SPI ROM, but don't get attached as we'll be whipping it back out shortly. Now to install the sideways ROM board, and in order to do so, we need to pop out the 6502 processor in IC1, as we have to insert that back into the sideways ROM board and then reinstall as a complete unit. Be very careful when pulling this chip, it's large and kind of important. For some reason I didn't film inserting it into the sideways ROM board, but here are a couple of pictures of how it looks when installed. Again, now is a time to be very careful as we're flying a little bit blind here with some of the pins obscured. When we're certain everything is lined up nicely across both sockets, we can pop the unit in. I can't stress enough how important it is to check as clearly as we can before pushing the chips home. Just one silly mistake here and we're ruining a nice bit of kit. Now for all of you who don't like to see motherboards bending, I've saved you the pain, aren't I nice? Now we just need to attach this wire to the westernmost pin of S21. You'll need to move the jumper so that it's attached only to the easternmost pin or remove it completely. And that's the hardware installation complete. And doesn't it look pretty? Apart from that mistake we have to correct. You see, if you remove the MB jumper from the sideways board, it re-enables physical ROMs 14 and 15, the two easternmost slots on the mainboard, and you can place physical ROMs in there. And this is a good thing in case you accidentally wipe the sideways ROM holding your basic language, because then you couldn't use the machine. So by removing the SPI physical ROM from socket 15 and moving our basic ROM to that socket, we have the Beeb looking in slot 15 first as it's the highest priority. It will find basic and then load slot 14 at DFS. At least then, if the sideways ROM board is accidentally wiped, we can still boot the machine to basic 
and use disks to repopulate the board. Right then, let's put our GoTech drive together. I've harvested this one from an old Amiga 500 I had lying around, but I want to add in the OLED screen rather than the standard three digit display. And I also want to add the rotary encoder to protect my poor old fingertips from having to keep pressing those tiny buttons. If you're not familiar with the GoTech drive, it's basically a modern storage solution that interfaces through a standard Shugart bus as used in many computers over the years. And interestingly, also some synthesizers that came with floppy drives. Installation is pretty simple. We have to supply a five volt positive and a ground to the power input here. There are a set of jumpers which should work out of the box, but the options are all laid out on the flash floppy firmware page. There's a link in the description. Here's where our OLED display will connect. And to fit our rotary encoder, we'll need to drill a hole in the front panel right here where this pilot mark is. When fitted, the rotary encoder allows us to cycle through the disk images on the USB stick much more quickly than pressing the buttons. Although the buttons will still work if you want to use them after this mod. To know what size of hole we need to drill, we'll use the fastening ring nut as a diameter guide. We're looking for a drill bit that is about one millimeter wider than the diameter of the hole in the nut. Now I reckoned it looked like about a six and a half mil bit, but no, that's far too small. Let's try a seven. And yep, that's just right. One drilled hole later, and we can pop in the encoder, which fits snug as a bug. Lovely. Let's fit the washer and tighten the nut before popping on the twiddly bit. I have to say that is satisfyingly clicky. Well, now with the rotary encoder in place, we'll pop the GoTech board in and make sure we don't have any clearance issues. And all looks good. So we can turn our attention to the OLED screen. You may have to remove some of the plastic material inside your GoTech drive, depending on the model, as it may have supports for the three digit display which aren't compatible with this unit. These marks look like I was at some point going to widen this hole, but I must have abandoned the idea. If we can see the display properly, I'll leave that hole as is. Wiring up the OLED is really straightforward. Just follow the instructions on the GitHub site in the description. There are only four wires to attach and the diagram is easy to follow. Let's pop it in the case and connect up the five volt and ground and see what happens. Instructions for flashing the firmware on these drives are also on the GitHub site. And again, it's really easy to do. Success. And to be honest, I wasn't expecting any less. These devices are pretty trouble free if you follow the instructions. We've got version 3.21 of Flash Floppy, which is the latest at the time of filming. We've now got the rotary encoder wired up according to the diagrams on the GitHub page. And it appears that we can scroll through our Amiga disks quite easily. We'd better replace those with some BBC discs, I guess. So that all seems to work. So we'll pop the case top back on, and then we'd better plug this along with the SPI MMC module into their relative ports on the Beeb, and then we can see if it all works. Now, usually I'd be powering the GoTech drive from the auxiliary power socket on the bottom of the Beeb, but I bought the wrong connector. So, We'll continue to use my jewelry rigged USB charger to power the drive for now. The GoTech floppy emulator cable goes rather conveniently into the disk drive connector on the Beeb, being careful to ensure it's the right way round, which is notched downwards. Next, it's the turn of the SPI module and the cable for this plugs into the user port on the Beeb, again, notched downwards. Right, let's power the old girl on and explore our new features. Booting up, we can already see some good news with the 1770 DFS notice on the screen and our GoTech drive showing a disk image called My Files waiting patiently to be used. We can scroll through the disk images with the twiddly knob and by using the star cat command, we see the drive light go on and the contents of the chosen disk image are shown. Twiddling the knob to choose a different disk image unmounts this one and mounts the newly chosen one and StarCat confirms we're looking at a different disk. Nice. 
Let's format this disk to 80 tracks using the star form 80 command and see if the disk write operations work. I've decided to speed this up in case you're not as patient as me, but it does appear to work. So it's safe to say we can swap disks, write to disks, so let's find out if we can load from disk. So you may have noticed that I have the disk for Elite on the GoTech drive, so let's try loading that. It really is nice to have that authentic disk drive experience, but without the risk to old and precious disks. It makes these old machines real alternatives to your PC or Mac for certain tasks. As I mentioned, I intend to use this to write the episodes, and why not? It's a perfectly good machine for that, so it deserves to get used. And I think that concludes the GoTech tests. We have a working disk drive system. Typing star ROMs lists the ROMs loaded into the system. 15 and 14 being the physical ROMs on the mainboard and the others being ones loaded into the sideways ROM slots. Let's try loading Snapper from one of those slots. And that seems to work too. There's still one aspect of this hardware installation we need to check, and that's the SPI interface. If you recall, we ended up taking out the physical SPI ROM and instead we'll attempt to use the SPI with the MMFS ROM loaded into the sideways board. If this works too, we've successfully upgraded the machine. Star card switches to the contents of the SD card, which we can catalogue as before. If we run the exclamation mark boot script from here and the SPI sideways ROM is working, we get access to the SPI menu, which we do. There are lots of things we can do with all of these upgrades, and we'll go into that in much more detail in the last episode in this series, when we'll also install that Raspberry Pi coprocessor. If before then, I can also land the speech chips and maybe even the Econet system, then we'll have one fully pimped up Model B. I do hope you've enjoyed this episode. There are links to most things we've discussed in the description if you're trying these upgrades yourself. As always, thanks for watching. Please hit the like button, subscribe to the channel and hit the bell to be notified of new content. Please leave your comments below, we always like to read them. And until next time in the shack, it's goodbye from me.